The guy that called me for that, he knows the first AE on this movie. We did a commercial, a BMW commercial. We shot for five days in downtown LA. I'd never worked with this guy before until that shoot. I got onto that shoot because I know the first AD who was running that shoot. He pulled me in on that shoot because it was a bunch of guys he didn't know, never worked with, and he at least wanted had somebody that he could trust and to help him run the set. I think I'm really being sincere. I want you like Welcome to the first podcast for This Post Life. We're a podcast about why transitioning to your life's passion just may be the hardest thing you'll ever do. Uh, we're going to have stories from people in film and TV post-production as well as from people in life in general who are just making transitions. Most of the stories we write about are about um, characters after a goal and there's obstacles and by the end of the story they've transitioned somehow. Um, we're we're going to talk about what it takes to actually uh, reach your goals. I personally think it takes a lot of effort. Uh, not necessarily like it has to be hard or anything, but um, you really have to make that a priority in your life to achieve it. I've had the idea to do this podcast for a long time, but Chris inspired me to go further with the podcast. We just got together to talk about post, and I thought I'd reach out to him and see if he needed any help networking or finding jobs. It came up in our conversation that I had this idea for a podcast. He said, hey, I've done some podcasts. I can help you out. I felt before I couldn't do the podcast alone. It just seemed like way too much work for me to do. But with help, you know, I was like re-energized. And I started to study more what to do. I'm still learning. It's a learning process. Heck, I don't even know how to post this thing up, but I'm going to go for it. An acquaintance of mine, Vincent Roca, a podcaster, YouTuber, reality show editor, he gave me some advice about it. He said, why aren't you doing it? And then he said, just do it. Unfortunately, Chris got too busy to carry on with us, but I really want to thank him for his part in helping bring the podcast to life. Okay, this audio file is May 6th, 16th, right? May 16th, 2018. March. The current time is... March 16th. Or March, May. What did I say, May? March 16th. All right. Punch it. <laughs> Bulu, so you've been in the industry uh, for how long? Well, first, uh, tell us what you do right now. Oh, yeah. Tell us what you do. Right now, I'm a like, uh, post-production assistant for uh, a movie that's called uh, Green Book, directed by Peter Farrelly. You may know him better as the guy who uh, directed uh, Hall Pass, the Dumb and Dumber movies, Something About Mary. And he also has a TV show. He's staying busy. So that's a pretty high-profile director. How'd you get that gig? The guy that called me for that, he knows the first AE on this movie. Okay, and you worked with that guy before? I worked with that guy before. We did a commercial, a BMW commercial. We shot for five days in downtown LA. I'd never worked with this guy before until that shoot. I got onto that shoot because I know the first AD who was running that shoot. He pulled me in to be his right hand on that shoot because it was a bunch of guys he didn't know, never worked with, and he at least wanted had somebody that he could trust and to help him run the set. Nice. And uh, we became friends. I became friends with a lot of those guys. We stayed in contact after that show. He's, he's not from Southern California. He's from Chicago. No family out here. And I invite him to come down, hang out. We'll, you know, have a few beers, get something to eat, just hang out for the, for the weekend, whatever. And he came out, and we talked about business, and and uh, you know we're good friends. Became we good friends, and then stay in contact with him sparsely throughout the year, the year, the following year, and then I get a call from him for this gig. It sounded like it was not just a regular post PA thing. I also had to do a bunch of other things, so like uh, I'd coordinate these screenings. I have to submit reports every week, time cards, um, mileage forms, and all these forms that, they you know, it's starting with all the start paperwork that you right. have to fill out, all that paperwork, I'd be in charge of all that. You originally got 
on the trajectory of Hollywood because you wanted to be a producer. Is that right? Right. Yeah, that's interesting because, like, I want to be an editor eventually. Um, and I think, well, before that, I need to be an assistant editor. And to get my foot in the door, I've been advised, hey, why don't you find a post-PA position? So and I've been talking to some editors, and then that's when they kind of brought up a lot of post-PA people actually end up being producers or directors, and that's what they want to do. So it's interesting. Now, this show is about transitioning. Like, you're maybe stuck not doing what you want to do and then something comes along or you made a decision to make that change to do something else and i know this is, and just because i know you this is a different direction for you from what you had been doing for the last couple of years or a few years um, what were you doing before and what prompted the transition before i was working for a biotech company in temecula that manufactured heart-assisted mm -hmm. devices. Well, then what happened? I just wanted to start something fresh. I wanted to sort of like cut the ties of that old life and move to something different, another direction. This is kind of sad to say. Even my friends I knew back then. Oh. And uh, one day I was uh, watching TV. You know, I saw programming for Spanish people. I saw programming for Chinese people, Japanese, every Asian group there was programming for them. You know, whether it be um, small public channel. And of course the main stuff is for the the white people and the black people. Sure. And I was like, I need to do that. I need to do that. I need to produce content. For my community. So it was community TV is what spurred me. That's what I wanted to do. What community is that? Uh, Pacific Islander. Specifically Pacific Island Rim. You know, and, and they're not just down there. They're also up here. There's probably more of them up here than down in the islands. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to produce content just for that little demographic. And I felt if I did it well enough, I could... Uh, eke out a decent living, mm -hmm. you know. I just wanted to fill that void because there was nothing there. Once I figured that out, I was like, and this is how primitive my thought was, oh man, that's what I need to do. I need to learn how to shoot a camera because once I learn how to shoot a camera, I can go shoot this thing, you know. And then with that thought, I looked into schools I knew nothing about it. I, I know that they had something. I, I wasn't sure if I was ready to drive down there. Uh, Mount San Jacinto had a... They didn't have a TV film program. They had like a multimedia program. I felt like, oh, let me just take that. See how it is. Mm -hmm. They talk about, you know, stuff, multimedia, con uh, convergence of all the different medias and so forth. So I registered for a class there. And um, I think I, I, did, I didn't last a week in that <laughs> class. Why? I felt it wasn't right. Okay, gotcha. you know, I just felt why I was in the right place. Right. And um, I just happened to look at uh, Riverside City College. And just so happened they had a TV and film program. I did not know that. Ah. Looked into that. I was still enrolled at Mount San Jacinto, and I, the semester already had started, and I saw that FTV 44, they were teaching that, that uh, semester, and it was being taught Tuesday nights. I was like, how do I get into that class? So I skipped the other class and went to RCC. To registration already had started. Gotcha. I think it was the first week or second week. And I showed up, and there was a bunch of other people there too, standing in the back, you know. Was that uh, so? Fort FTV Forty Four. That's Mag magazine class. Magazine class. So it's like a it's like a new uh, kind of like a it's a the magazine show. So it's kind of like a um, entertainment tonight uh, type show. Gotcha. Really, you know, it's not it's not. Hard news, 
And after a week of that, how did you feel? When I made that decision, it was all a uh, pipe dream. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all this like it was abstract. Right. And this goal, this aspiration that was over here, that I was, oh man, I need to get there. Um, and I wasn't, um, I didn't know quite how to get there. Mm-hmm. But when I came to that class, and when I walked in that class, I saw the cameras, I saw the blue screen, I think it was there, or the green screen. Um, and then I started hearing the people talk about stuff. Bud, Fred, Nino, and some of the, uh, the other students that had been there. I started tasting it. Feeling that, wow, it can actually happen. Yeah. You know? And that's when I, I uh, withdrew from Mount San Jacinto and went and got um, ad forms to add to these classes. Nice. I looked at the the book, the schedule. Uh, uh, FTV 44, wow, that's great. Magazine production, TV production. Uh, FTV 45, wow, news production. I'm going to get that one. Um, 64, I think it was, the editing. All these classes, I add on them all. Nice. Audio uh, tech class. Not knowing what I'm in store for. <laughs> all at once? Or all at once. <laughs> that same <laughs> semester. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. Like, oh, man, this I need this. Yeah. And I did feel, if, even today, I still feel it. I'm behind. Wow. And I need to right. step on the gas. Sure, I need to sure. go. Sure. You know? I should have been here. 20 years ago or right. 10 years ago 15 years ago at that time you know um, and so I, I wanted to take all this at one time get it done and we be ready for the world you know so yeah I did that and not realizing what was in store and I got burned out I almost dropped the program because of all the, the load of the classes the load, the load of the class was just too much wow I went and met with the chair, who was Bud, at the time. And he said, he told me to uh, hang on. Just hang in there. And if if I did need to drop class or classes, don't drop his class. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did I didn't drop any. I just I just muscled through it. And then um and then I felt like I could do anything at that point. Nice. You know. Right. And that's when you were an SI for my first class at RCC, which was the editing class. Yes. Now, for people who don't understand, what is an SI exactly? Oh, SI stands for a Supplemental Instructor. And that's where, that's where we met. And then Chris, this is Chris Rangel. Tell us, um, when did you go to RCC? I came into RCC, oh, geez, I started off, <laughs> I was all over the map. And uh, that's kind of like where I you know, crossed paths and just kind of got my start. It was a great learning experience that something that has not been, um, that I have not seen anywhere else, really. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Now, Pulu, so you were at RCC for quite a while, though. How long, yes. How long were you there? I got two degrees from there. I was still working there. Right. In fact, uh, it's, which kept me there. I was no longer taking classes, but I was still with the department. And the department would be asked to, to produce or to do these videos for the campus. Mm-hmm. And then those jobs would be filtered down to me. I'd seek, they would give me the names. I'll go talk to them, work out a script. And so forth, and shoot it and produce it. Uh, it's on it's on YouTube um, somewhere at the college channel. But that kept me there for about two years. At the same time, I was doing that. I was that's when I was making my move to LA as far as gigs. Okay. Yeah, you know, they they had they had uh, ABC had produced a show on campus. That one that was called Splash. 
I was one of uh, 15 students from RCC film program that got to come on and work on the show. Was Working Splash your introduction to being, was that your first network show? Well, yeah, that was my first, uh, not only my first production, but first network one, and the first to see how this is done. Hey, at this point, we'd probably have a sponsor ad like, but this is all pro bono, bro, maybe in the future. So that was one transition. You kind of went from working at RCC to working on this network show, which just happened to be at the school. Right. Then how did you keep that going then from... Uh, so out of the 15, I would mention earlier, the 15 people that they hired, the, the, there was, there was uh, three people that kept bringing back every day. The other 15 or whatever, they would come only on shooting days. I was put in charge of what they call crafty. Right. I was in charge of like what we need and so forth. Now that was my job every day. Hmm. In charge of crafty, then uh, coffee, juices, sodas, chips, candy, everything. Wherever there was a crafty station, I was in charge of making sure that I was taken care of. There was a station for the producers and the directors in the control room. I'd make sure of that. There was one by uh, where the uh, ADs and those guys were at. There was one in the VIP. And there was one where the talent was. I made sure all these stations were, you know, stocked. Right. And I've heard a, so I heard a story recently about way, the way that works is uh, as a PA... They give you tasks to do, and it's all—it's basically to see it, it, it's like levels of trust. Yes. So they're they're gonna they're gonna trust you with with stocking the food, right? And then the next thing you know, who knows? You may they may trust you to wash their car, or <laughs> you know what I mean? Like more and more stuff, and pretty soon, then hey, this is this is definitely a good guy. So we're gonna, well, they trusted me to make a list. There you go to buy. You know, I'd go down there and pull up. Can you make an inventory list of what we need and then give it to Tim and Tim will go and buy it? After I got took care of that, then I'd sink into the regular PA with the rest of the group. Oh, okay. Where now, let's wrap up this table. Was there a lead wrap, PA? Uh, actually, it was key, I would call it. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't know it then, but I was the key. Ah. If you look on IMDb, I'm the key. Nice. On all those, that whole season. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that was, I was the key. And, and, because they would tell me, hey, whenever you see the PAs come over here, tell them they need to do this. And direct them this way. And that would tell them this is what they need to be doing. And don't, don't make sure they're not standing around here. Right. They shouldn't be standing around. They should be always m moving. So you, you tell them that, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, I would do that. Um, task as well uh, to go back earlier where you we were talking about how I was transitioning mm -hmm. I was still doing work for RCC the film department and transitioning out those guys when the show would wrap then now they go back to LA now they're on managing other shoots and so forth and so I was as I as the work for RCC started I was starting finishing that work I would call those guys Send them an email. Oh, I see. Because the call sheet has everybody's information. Oh, nice. And I keep every call sheet. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> and the, the other person, I always seek advice from FTV, is Bud and Jack. Jack, who, Jack McLean, who taught the lighting class, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. teaches the lighting class. I would always seek their advice. And Jack told me, uh, uh, oh, you should... Make sure you have a production manager, line producer, and uh, coordinators on your dial-up, your roller decks, if you will. Those are people you reach out to. So I reached out to them. As soon as they, right away, they got back with me. Hey, can you do this on this day? Are you ready? Can you do a shoot from from uh, from April to July? 
Boom. Nice. So those guys, the production manager, the two of them, production managers on Splash, I credit them even to this day. If I ever like want some kind of word, I have, have to credit those guys. Go back to credit those guys. Because this that guy uh, opened a door for me to, to go on the path where I'm at. Even to this even to this this job here. That guy from that first gig. Gotcha. So I would pull me out and uh, would take me on his shoots. And these other production managers would see, wow, this guy. Those other PAs too. This guy, he's he's got it or something, right? Because when they would have shoots, they would pull me in. I would be their go-to person, right? Mm -hmm. They would pull me in to their productions. So whenever these production managers had a shoot, they would pull me into their, their shoots as the, the main guy. The first guy to call uh, and the main guy to be on the, the right hand to get things done. The only thing I had, and I tell people this, the only thing I had, because I didn't know nobody, and this is a new area for me, all I had was my work ethic. That's all I had. Uh, I knew I could I could do this work, and uh, I reached out that one time, and that's it. Wow. To this day, I don't do that no more. It just kept coming, you know. In fact, the, the shoots were so, so, uh, like when I'm on a shoot, I don't know if every PA does that, but I'm on a heightened level of awareness. You know, my, 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 uh, sensitivities to what's going on, what should be done is heightened at a level that's that's like uh, it's almost like when you when you rev your, when you have your engine idle mm -hmm. it's like right right but when you press that gas it's going eh. my mind is like that it's like that that engine that throughout the whole the whole day right right it's a heightened level so I'm not I may look relaxed but I'm not. My mind is working. You know, like, okay, we can wrap that. That's done. Let's wrap it. Get it out of here. Oh, that needs to be replaced. You know, so those things in my mind, you know, it's heightened. And it's, and you got to be like that. Right. So it's like, uh, I used to tell uh, uh, Bud, like, uh, you know, the makes a great PA is, uh, not the one that when the producer, the director says, "Hey, I need this," you you like you're right there. To go, oh, got it. Mm -hmm. Is the one that says, "It's right here." <laughs> nice. I need this. Oh, yeah, right here. It's the one that can anticipate. Right. And you can anticipate. Only way you can anticipate is having been on set numerous times, because mm -hmm. you're uh, you're surrounded. You'll be around different circumstances. You see the same thing. Oh, I remember that situation when I was at that shoot. They mean it this. And what I would do, I would have these cargo pants. I would have my pockets be full of like something that, I, that they might need it for this. Mm. Even something simple as a uh, paper towel. Like they're setting up a little table where the guy's going to knock this over and it's spill. Hey, we can get a paper towel. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you telling me those guys those guys not thinking about that you know right. I remember you tell me also that you would keep uh, spare copies of the call sheet on you just in case oh yeah I always yeah that, that. <laughs> there's always one guy minimum on a shoe it's like oh I don't have a call can, can, can someone get me a call and you're like here you go right yeah. this way yeah. well the, 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 the number one reason I would have that not only to keep it for my own records but yeah, I mean you, you, you get emailed that and there's supposed to be copies already on what they call a distro table, mm -hmm. copies of that for anybody to come. But as a PA, you're also a runner. You know, hey, well, I need you to go uh, to Hollywood Expendables where we ordered this, and you pick up five rolls of uh, duct tape. We need a roll of uh, duvetine, mm -hmm. so forth, whatever. And so you go there, 
And let's say something happens. You don't have everybody's number in your head. Right. That call sheet has that. And one of the guys I brought on to a shoot and Slave Apprentice, he didn't do that. And it cut him loose. Oh, wow. I'm like, why didn't you call? Why didn't you call the, uh, the uh, coordinator office? I didn't know. I didn't have his number. Right? He said, I didn't have nobody's number. That's why you got to have the call sheet <laughs> with you at all times. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a... You know? Yeah. yeah you got to keep that call sheet on you. Yeah. And that happens you. a lot. Right. But to get back to those guys, they would wrap up the show, move to L.A., I'd reach out to them, mm -hmm. and they just kept. And then there was other guys, too. And we, I know all those guys. We're all friends. But they call me first. And if I can't do it, they call the next one. And then the other ones, if they need extra up, they'll call them, too. Right. I got exposed to these other PMs, production managers. They would do commercials. Now, that one commercial was done by one of those PMs. It was a BMW commercial. What I went up on, would I meet that guy who got me this job? Gotcha. Yeah. We still have one more transition, I think, to cover. Before this last PA gig, you were, uh, what I alluded to earlier was you transitioned into that from another career path. You were actually working in network television, and now you're now you're post PA on a feature film. Right. So that transition, I'm curious about too. So. Um, what prompted that? And is, is this more in line with what, what you, uh, what you want to do, what your passion is? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Better question. So where I was on the network level, uh, where I was and where I wanted to get to, TV is actually where I was uh, really going for TV, I wanted to produce TV stuff. Mm -hmm. But as I'd mentioned earlier, in the network, where I was at and to get to where I wanted to go, mm -hmm. that took me um, years having to put in the work. There's all these other people I would have to leapfrog mm -hmm. or they would have to go away. Right. Or somebody yeah. would have to see favor on me to pull me right up right there to that spot. Sure. You know? Mm -hmm. and they, they saw a favor of me to have me on set, have me part of the production, keep me employed, which is great. I mean, a lot of people, hey, it's the job, you know? But to get to where, I would have to either have create my own show to even make that bump up, you know? Yeah, which was I was trying to do on the side, you know, mm -hmm. doing my own shows and writing stuff up. Do you still want to do that? Uh, yeah, I still do. Okay. Yeah. So where do you see yourself now? Now I'm kind of like at a crossroads. Uh, I, I do, I, I did want to transition out where I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I was... Uh, one of the prize coordinators on the game show. So we dealt with all the stuff that came in. Um, this is not you were a prize like you were a catch, but prizes for the show. Prizes right? like a <laughs> motorcycle, yeah. refrigerator, washer dryer, car, trip to Bahamas, those kind of prizes, you know. And that's, know. so that's a, I mean, that seems... Like a decent job, it is a decent job, and it's a it's a good job. Mm -hmm. And the people that do it are good, great people that I work with. And um, they actually were thinking of uh, moving me up this season. If you continue in that trajectory, does that get you closer to producing? Yeah, uh, possibly producing that stuff. I gotcha, but uh, you said. You saw the road was long and taking that path. Yeah, there's other people, you know, even my close friends, they all want to do that too. Mm -hmm. 
me coming from like just out of from Riverside you know I want to be that I'm not gonna leapfrog them you know what I mean they're gonna I'm, I'm my job is to make them look good that's why they call me all the time sure you know right and so uh, doing the prizes uh, department and all that great I love the people it was in here wasn't working in your heart it wasn't working. yeah I wasn't working I was uh, and I should be you know the logically I should be okay with I'm getting paid I'm on a job I'm working in the industry like all the other people next to me right uh, they're all they're all happy making good money they're they're hundreds thousands of people that would kill to be in that position that aren't yeah you know like uh well, the guy who was my that was working with me, he wanted to be a uh, 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 like a director, but he reached that point, and he was like, you know what, I'm gonna have to do this, this, and this, go that much more to get there. I, I'm good right here. Gotcha. I'm, I'm getting a good check. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. Actually, I, I was out for a job year-round job like I would never be on a dry moment there would be no month no days and week that I would have not have a job but I turned that down but then that then it comes to you make those decisions based on what's in your heart so what were your thoughts at that time to make you decide Re to yeah reject that okay it was just so off of what I was thinking when I was coming from RC Riverside. By the way, I don't call it R C C. I call it Riverside School for the Arts. <laughs> R S A R S A. <laughs> I tell that to everybody. Oh yeah, this little school in Riverside is Riverside School for the Arts. That's the name of the program. You know. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm so I'm changing my resume now. <laughs> if you look at my shit, you see that on there. <laughs> um. But yeah, I uh, the leaving that program, having this goal, and then being off of that job, which is a good job. And I always be working. It was wasn't a long list, right? It was like more like a year, and for me to commit to that job, it was a three year commitment. I have to be dedicated in a three year contract in that position. And after the three years, we talk about it again, and we can extend you if you want to stay there, you know, and so forth, for for like another two years, five years. So that's five years, three years, five years out of, at least that's the way I was thinking, mm -hmm. out of moving towards this spot. And this spot being? Writer, producer, producing my own stuff. Okay. Or producing stuff, you know, whether it be preferably my own, but uh, I want to be in the arena where I'm also producing, uh, whether it's Chris wrote something and like, I, wow, wow, that's great. Let me produce it. Mm -hmm. Let me get the pieces together, make it happen. So do you feel that your transition to editorial helps that or is it just um, kind of a stepping stone towards something else? In the yeah, I think a stepping stone towards something else because... Even when I was in the uh, the TV stuff, um, I was already looking, and post was in my mind because mm -hmm. I was thinking back to school, right? right. Like, what did I do most over there? I was producing these shows, and I spent a lot of time editing right. stuff. You know, right? Um, you were in the editing room all the time. Yeah, just watching this stuff or editing stuff for the. Uh, um, you know, whatever thing was happening at that time. You know, it wasn't fancy stuff. or was just editing, putting a cut together. And I was looking to get in post in the uh, network. But the, the guys that was in that, uh, the, in the post in that show, I mean, these guys have been there 18 years. They ain't going nowhere. Mm. They even told me that. Right. So yeah. all those positions are filled, is what you're saying. Yeah, and this is not a big editorial right, uh, right. department. It's like only like 
a few guys, you know. And these guys have been there doing it, so they got their own routine. They're comfortable with each other. Mm-hmm. And they actually recommended to me, like, oh, just uh, just talk to people, try and get in somewhere. Like another show, you can get in Another somewhere show else. somewhere else. Right. Not there. Because they said, oh, nobody's going anywhere here, you know. From the networking I've done... Uh, I talked to a lot of editors, assistant editors, PAs. Um, they work on numerous shows. They yes. bounce around a lot. Right, so, right. I mean, to uh, for the most part, there are there are a few that are stuck with a certain thing for quite a while. But it seems like, yeah, that the pathway isn't necessarily sticking with one show. It's no working on various shows and then right and then you know depending on whatever level they're at if they're a pas they want to assist and if they're assists a lot of times they want to edit right um you have those you have those guys that are really just what they're they want to stay in the technical right they like editorial but they they want to stay in the technical so they'll they'll be assistants for ever or engineers or whatever but you know they don't they don't have aspirations to be an editor necessarily. Yeah, I've se- I've seen those guys. Yeah, they do that. So this little meeting, it's kind of a full circle type of thing. We're all from RCC, and then we're all in the post PA world right now. So it's a that's kind of it's an interesting coincidence. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the happy one. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have this conversation. Well, Pulu, thank you for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Um, So that's just uh, another look into how people transition from one thing to another. And and everyone's got, like like we talked about earlier, there's no one way to make it in this industry. Here's here's one example. And if there's anything you take away from this is always keep your call sheet handy. I think I'm going to be insincere. So there you go. Episode one is in the books. If you want to share your story, hit me up. Uh, Subscribe to be notified for future episodes. Thanks for listening. This post life.